Good afternoon, everyone. We're just going to wait a couple of minutes to get started, but welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Mid-Atlantic Teaching Artists Virtual Retreat. My name is Susan Auchin, and I work at the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. Today's session will be recorded and later shared online. So please turn off your video if you don't wish to be recorded. Today's workshop is called Art as Microphone empowering student voices through transformative art education and will be led by Matthew Adelberg. I'll now turn things over to our producer, Susan Zoll, for a brief review of some technical housekeeping items. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Susan. If we could just advance to the next slide. So if you want to pin the interpreter, and if you have not yet seen the interpreter, you can scroll through your um, video cameras to find Laura. Uh, it, it will say interpreter Laura. And next to her webcam or the top right of her webcam, if you want to click on the three dots, you get a drop down menu and then click on pin uh, video. And that will keep just Laura's video up for you. If you prefer to see all videos that are being shared, you would click top right of your screen where it says gallery view, as you can see in that image, or stay in the active speaker view if you wanna just see who's speaking. And on the next slide, just a little bit about troubleshooting. If you get bumped out, just use the same link that you used to come in initially and try to get back in. Um, as, as Susan O mentioned, the session's being recorded. so. If you do get bumped out, you can always watch the recording later. And um, if you do need assistance, you get bumped out, you might want to jot my, my name, Susan Zahl, and my number right there on the screen. I also just chatted it out to you. Uh, you can chat me with questions or give a call if you do get bumped out and need some help. On the next slide, I want to show you a few things about the meeting controls. So if you point your cursor at the bottom of your screen, your meeting control should pop out. At the far right, you'll see where it says chat. You can double click on that to pop the chat out and um, go ahead and say hello. I know some of you have already done that, um, but you can ask your questions there. And um, Susan oh, will be asking um, at the end. Hello, Karen, thank you. Um, and then uh, just to the left a bit, there is, hi everybody, there is participants. If you wanna double click and pop out your participant list, I'm gonna show you a few things on the next slide. Um, one is how to change your name. So if you hover over your name, once you've double clicked and popped out participants, you should be able to rename yourself. So if you want to add your pronouns, you can go ahead and do that now, or maybe you came in with an, the wrong name or someone else's link. So you can go ahead and change your name. And 
on the next slide, I want to show you one more thing while you're in the participant uh, panel, and that is how to engage in the session. So um, if you do want to raise your hand, there's a blue hand. It looks a little different than what you're seeing on the screen, but the icons are the same. Um, the functionality, I should say, is the same. There is a green check, a red X. If you need to step away, you might want to put up that clock that's under more. That means you had to step away. And I believe I've covered them all. I want to send it back to Susan Utchin. Thank you, Susan Z. Sure. So again, just welcome everyone. Um, and thanks for being here today. Matthew Adelberg is an artist and educator from Baltimore, Maryland. He is currently the visual arts teacher, fine arts department chair, and equity fellow at the Baltimore Polytechnic Institute. Matt is deeply passionate about art education as a social justice issue and works collaboratively with students to develop relevant emergent curriculum stemming from their lived experiences. For more information about Matt and his good work, look to the chat box to download the retreat presenter packet, which I'll go ahead and chat to you in just a moment. Um, two quick notes, in case there is weather moving in or there's internet difficulties and for some reason we get bumped off, just come back on with the same Zoom link and we'll I'll join each other back here just in case that happens. Also, Matt wanted to just hold questions until the end. There will be some Q&A time at the end, but please feel free during our presentation here to chat your questions out to the group and I'll keep track of them so that we can circle back at the end of the presentation and, and hear from your questions. So now let's please welcome Matt and let's begin. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt. Um, and I'm excited to be here today. I just want to thank you guys so much for coming and taking time out of your day. Um, I'm really passionate about teaching art as a microphone, uh, as a way to empower students to discuss, explore, and grapple with themselves and their community through art as a medium. This stems from my own experiences growing up as a young person in Baltimore, uh, struggling with the arrest of my father and the anger and frustration that I felt growing up poor and surrounded by violence. And art was a way for me to make sense of these issues in my life, to question myself and to grow. And I believe that art of every kind has the potential to be that tool for our students if we as artists and educators embrace transformative pedagogy, which is summed up by this quote on the bottom, that it's education is not carried on by a teacher for a student or a teacher about a student, but rather a teacher with a student. So what is transformative education? It's generative. It focuses on large connected themes and it problematizes ourselves and our context. Now, when I say problematizes, I don't mean make a problem. What I mean is it encourages us to challenge and think critically about ourselves, our context and the world that we live in with a questioning and critical lens. Um, therefore, it's based in a mutual creation and recreation of knowledge uh, in which students and teachers are both active subjects in their own learning. Transformative education isn't a transfer of knowledge approach. It's something that's mutually discovered through critical dialogue and questioning that centers around students' lived experiences. And since learning is centered around our students' context and their lived experiences, it can't and shouldn't be something that is predetermined and passed down or prescribed from teacher to a student. Discussion, brainstorming and research are all essential in the process of art making and transformative education. Through pointed questioning, through dialogue, we can guide students to discuss, investigate, research, and respond to their contexts and their experiences. And that is what becomes the backbone of art making. In doing so, we must concretely situate our pedagogy, right, how we teach, within the community that we work with. And we should always be viewing our community and our students within the context of, of their reality, right? Because they don't exist in the bubble of school or the buildings that you're working with them in. They have entire lives and circumstances outside of those rooms that we occupy. So contextualizing our pedagogy and students learning within their experiences are essential. To do so, relationship building is crucial and experiencing firsthand the communities that you serve is essential. Walk around the neighborhoods your students occupy. Go to the local stores, 
get your hair cut in the barber shops and salons, right? Play sports in the local parks. Get to know their reality so that you can better contextualize learning within your classroom. This is essential because a student is more likely to be influenced by background discourse than the teacher's pedagogy, since that background discourse is a learner's means for deciphering school, right? In other words, their lived experiences, their life, their context, their background is the lens through which they're seeing everything. So we need to make a huge effort to understand that since that is their means of understanding. So let's dive into a little bit of theory, right? A theoretical framework and then how it might look in practice. The first tenet of, of transformative education is that learning is mutually created. Learning has the potential to be an effective, validating, and empowering thing if it is something that is mutually created through interactions, questioning, and relevance. Students' voices uh, must be valued and taken into consideration. They are the experts on themselves, their lives, and their learning. It's important to acknowledge this and treat them as such, right? They are the experts. Using their voices, we may develop a culturally responsive approach where curriculum and planning incorporates, responds to, addresses, and then translates a student's lived experiences into relevant instruction and learning within classrooms. Something I start my classes with every year is a zine project where students make mini handmade books about their stories and all that that might mean. Students brainstorm, write, and draw about their lives. And from there, I invite students to become a part of a committee of sorts after school. This committee is filled with students who represent a diverse array of experiences, both within and outside of my classroom. This includes extremely attentive, engaged students, students who are off to ask or disengage, or students who I might perceive to be disruptive. I try to get a very diverse array of students to help inform planning and instruction because this committee is going to help me understand how I need to approach my teaching. Um, this committee meets once a week and serves to guide and inform both the curriculum and also the pedagogical decisions that I make. And we use the zines created during this unit and the large themes that arise as a thematic scope and sequence for the year. And finally, I scaffold in skills and techniques into this developing curriculum. After roughly a month, I ask students to invite a friend to take their place within the committee. After doing so, they assume specific roles within the classroom. Doing so ensures that there are always fresh ideas and that we as a community are continuing to evolve, grow, and improve. And it also fosters deep and relevant relationships between students who might not otherwise affiliate with each other. So here are some examples of student work that have come from this unit. This unit also helps me better understand how students are coming into the classroom, right? I'm going to approach a student very differently if I understand that they're thinking about their life at 16 years old from a lens of how long I can make it, right? From a survival mode uh, than I would a different student, right? So this allows me to cater uh, not only the curriculum, but how I engage with students, how I address behaviors, how I, I meet them as human beings um, and serves to really help that. The second tenet of transformative education is that learning comes out of questioning. Questioning ourselves, our surroundings, our context, our experiences, our world, right, our realities. Um, these questions generate relevant dialogue and conversations about our, our lived experiences. And through this dialogue, learning and understanding are created and recreated mutually, right? There's mutual creation of knowledge from st uh, students and teachers. So a theme that arose from the zine unit um, was this idea of community and home, right? Students and I began to ask ourselves questions like, what does community mean to you? What is community, um, how has your community, sorry, affected you? And how are you viewed from people outside of the community? How are you viewed from people inside of that community? 
from there, guided by these questions, we began to examine our communities through collage. Right, collage served as a really natural artistic approach to address community as it's many pieces of paper, right, that form the whole thing. And as we began to collage about our unique neighborhoods and our specific communities, we began to look at the narratives that are told about Baltimore, Baltimore schools, and Baltimore residents. And our work evolved to become a counter narrative to ourselves and our city, adding nuance to a conversation that is both dreadfully lacking and dangerously lacking such. This is a lovely piece. The student had a piece of mylar transparency over top of it, right? So the perception actually obscured the reality uh, to the viewer unless you were willing to peel it back. The third tenet of transformative education is that learning comes out of engaging with different and diverse arrays of experiences. Each student comes to our classrooms with different experiences and these differences create questions and problems during dialogue, right? And if a nurturing and caring environment is created, those differences and those problems lead not to conflicts, but rather a deeper understanding, sense of empathy and learning. So as such, learning is constructed socially and within a communal context. An example of that in practice, uh, something that happened very organically three years ago in my classroom. Students began eagerly sharing their themes, like the ones I showed you earlier. And as you saw, those are filled with deep, heartfelt, vulnerable, and personal stories. Um, one by one, they were asking for opportunities to share them with each other. And one student, Najee, suggested that we have them all out permanently in our classroom so that, quote, all of our stories are here surrounding us, end quote. I teach about 180 students a year. And in the past three years, there have been three students total who have not put their zines up on this pledge open to their entire school community. As I've said a few times, learning is not passed on, right? It is mutually constructed. Transfer of knowledge approaches to education deny students uh, their own voice and ownership in their education. Now, one of the main reasons that transfer of knowledge approaches to education in art are so dangerous and stifling is that art in its very essence is and has always been a form of communication. So if you think back, if any of you have kids, think back for a minute to when they learned how to talk. Did they learn how to talk because they wanted to know where to put a semicolon or where to, where to put a comma, how to spell a word, right? No, they learned how to talk because there was something essential that they had to communicate. I think the same should be said for art making. Techniques are important. Sure, 100%, but only as a means of communicating effective, effectively. History matters a lot, but only as a way of understanding our context and our voice. Centering art as a language allows learning to be constructed mutually. You've got the skills, historical, technical knowledge already, but the students have the meaning, the voice, the drive, right? They have all of that. They're experts in that. We just have to tap into it. Now, I'm not saying don't teach skills. Right, when I speak to art teachers about this, um, I always encounter a little bit of feedback, uh, pushback. I'm not saying don't teach skills. I'm just saying don't teach them for the sake of teaching them. Right, teach them as, for the sake of communication. So in practice, students researched and explored and then eventually expressed socially conscious messages that were important to them. This required students to grapple extensively with different experiences and opinions in our classroom. This student, Kevin, is a trans student. Kevin sat next to Durante. Durante didn't believe that trans people were real. He'd never met someone who was trans before, right? That led to a lot of empathy and understanding on Durante's part as he got to know Kevin, Kevin's work, and Kevin's lived experiences.
Another example um, of this is we looked at contemporary and historic art exemplars, and we looked at data about Baltimore and the history of Baltimore. Um, and then we learned drawing skills in order to engage in an artistic dialogue about one, why we matter, and then two, addressing the social context through which we're making art, and then three, confronting or disrupting single stories, biases, or misconceptions that were held about us. So uh, I took these slides right out of a, a PowerPoint from my school. So we're looking at redlining, which was an unethical uh, practice that was in the 1930s in Baltimore and across the, the country. It was banned in 1968, and it systemically denied services to residents of certain areas based on their race or ethnicity. Um, you could see it in a systemic uh, divestment of neighborhoods and communities based upon race rather than qualification. Um, we also looked at restrictive covenants, which began in 1925, where there were agreements between new and existing property owners. Um, people were forced and pressured to sign, which committed them never to sell their property to people of color. These, co these covenants were not private agreements. Uh, they frequently were government sanctioned and enforced. In Baltimore, there was a committee on segregation until 1968. Um, that upheld those and enforced them. So we looked at those in our classroom and we looked at the redlining map of Baltimore from 1937. We pair it with the poverty map of Baltimore from a few years ago, and then we overlaid it and made it transparent to see how the art context has been intentionally shaped, right, by institutional practices of racism and oppression. And then we look at how that has affected our neighborhoods and where how we show up and where we show up and what our neighborhoods look like today, right? So we looked at segregation in 1970 and we compared it to segregation from 2010. We looked at how the re um, redlining and restrictive covenants uh, created food deserts in Baltimore, vacant buildings in Baltimore, segregation in Baltimore, income inequality in Baltimore, unemployment in Baltimore. And then incredibly relevant right now as we engage in distance learning, we look at how that impacts uh, families with internet access or not. And how each of these things correspond with the redlining map and historic covenant. And then we looked at local funding, right? Because if we're gonna talk about issues of mattering, we should talk about how much money is allocated per people, right? Now these funding gaps cause Baltimore City Schools to be uh, defunded, um, underfunded $290 million a year for a total of $2.9 billion in 10, over a 10-year period. Yet the governor of Maryland suggests that enough money goes to Baltimore City Schools and additional resources aren't needed. Right, so we look at all of this in our classroom. And then we begin to look at some contemporary and historic art exemplars. Right, so a large conversation that ensued from this project is representation and self-definition. Who is the power to define self? Who is the power to define others? And what does it, what effect does it have on a group of people to be defined by someone else? A good example of this is the artist Margaret Boland and the artist Toy and Udutala. Now, Toy and Udutala's work is celebratory. It's filled with gold and precious metals in the hair and skin uh, and clothing. Margaret Boland's work is deeply traumatic, right? We see young black women in white face with cotton in their hair and blood on them. Now, when we're talking about power and representation, we had this discussion in, in my classroom, in our classroom, that Margaret Boland is a white woman from Georgia, right? Now, what does it mean for Margaret Boland as a white woman from Georgia to be painting this? And how is it different than Toy Nudutello, who is an artist of color, right? So we're having these conversations about representation. Um, and I think that that's important because art represents lived experiences, right? Uh, the right to create is an inalienable right. It's directly linked to our liberty and our happiness. And so a question we ask ourselves in, in our classroom is how and why is creativity creativity regularly obscured or denied? Who is most frequently denied those experiences, right? Because denying creativity denies human beings right to define themselves and their culture and their community. And to create and define self, culture, and community is to say we matter. So who is visible? Who is shown? By whom? And how? Are incredibly important. It's also incredibly important for students to see themselves in the work that we do, to be able to re relate to and see themselves both in the artist and their creation. Oftentimes, artists of color and women are frequently underrepresented in the scope and sequence of art history, and it is incredibly important. It is paramount to disrupt this narrative and showcase artists that better represent the populations that you serve. So after looking at all of that, students began to, to make their portraits.
Now, I'm not going to read this artist statement, but I do think it's important to show that if art is a form of communication, it's incredibly uh, important that students are very critical and very, very um, intentional about how they use their space. So here you see an artist statement by this student um, sort of justifying uh, the visual decision making that they made. I do want to read this one, though. The artist statement says, I would like for my portrait to speak to young black women with insecurities and self-doubt who feel silenced or overlooked by a world that does not empower or appreciate them. My portrait exudes confidence and peace within myself as a black woman who has always struggled with self-love and self-acceptance. Black women are so often portrayed in a negative and inferior light, and we are expected to be silent and submissive to society that tells us we are not smart, we are not beautiful, we are not talented, and we don't deserve to feel praised or empowered. As a result, we must empower and accept ourselves and portray the many sides and many voices of Black women that are often ignored. My self-portrait shows a Black woman in her own light. She is confident and she is empowered by her identity, not ashamed of it. As a Black woman, I've always struggled to love my skin, my hair, my features, and everything else about my racial identity. I've grown to find beauty and security in who I am, and I've chosen to em em emphasize my hair and my skin and my features in their natural state as a way to express confidence and self-love as a Black woman, exactly as I am. Now, part of creating an environment where learning is mutually created means decentralizing uh, the learning network, right? Letting go of control. Um, here we see students grading each other for a midway critique. I think it is important to note that the rubric they're using is student develop, so that assessment tools are not being projected by me, but developed communally and in partnership. The product of this project has been immense representation of my students district-wide. Um, it's resulted in district-wide pop-up shows where we're showcasing students' work within communities, right? Instead of asking them to come to the schools, we're going out there, right, into their neighborhoods, their communities, and showing their work. Uh, it has recently resulted in a complete renovation of our high school art curriculum um, with a heavy push to allow current students to participate in that writing. Uh, and it has resulted in a social justice and equity-focused curriculum meant to reflect um, and translate students' lived experiences across the entire school district. Perhaps most importantly in these sort of tenets of transformative education is that learning is relevant to lived experience. Authentic learning cannot and does not exist in a bubble. It must come from our reality. It must come from our context, which could include cultural context, geographical, ethnic context, socioeconomic context. Right, as well as the experiences um, from which you come. An example of this is a unit a uh, student of mine in Jamaica came up with uh, a few years ago that focused on the things that we carry with them. She was craving the opportunity to discuss the things that kind of weighed on her um, every day she came into school. This unit empowered students to express and investigate the everyday things 
that affect them, right? What they bring into the classroom every single day into our school. And it allowed our after school planning committee, by the way, a lot more jumping off points to continue de developing for us all. I don't know if you can read it, but on our back it says never enough. Now, each of these is about four by six inches long. Now, all of these things that we've discussed are supported by this last tenant of transformative education, which is that learning is supported um, by trust, care, and deep, authentic, meaningful relationships. Ensuring the right conditions are present to grow individually and collectively is essential. And we as artists and teachers must cultivate a, a nurturing, respectful, yet challenging environment that empowers, learns from, challenges, and elevates uh, students' voices. So a question that comes out of that, right, is how do you show that you care? And I, I think the most fundamental foundational way is empathy, right? And I think that uh, this passage here um, does a great job about explaining it. It says, when you plant lettuce and if it doesn't grow well, you don't blame the lettuce, right? You look for reasons why the lettuce might not be doing well. Maybe it needs fertilizer, maybe it needs more water, maybe it's getting too much sun or too little, but you don't blame the lettuce, right? Yet for some reason, when we have problems with our friends or our family, or let's put in educational context with our students, we blame them or we try to reason with them. But if we know how to take care of them, they will grow better, just like the lettuce. Blaming has no positive effect at all, nor does trying to persuade or use reason or argue, right? That's my experience. No blame, no reasoning, no argument, just understanding. If you understand and you show that you understand, then you can love and the situation will change. I'll expand that further and say, if you show that you're even trying to understand, if you're making that effort, right, then you can love and the situation might change. So how else do you show that you care? Uh, do extra, right? Go above and beyond. Uh, we host monthly gallery talks with professional artists for our students. Uh, shameless plug, if anyone's interested, hit me up. I'd love to feature your work and have my students have access to awesome artists. Right? But we bring in artists every month for our students to meet, to see the work, to engage in it, and to meet professional artists right, who are doing this work in their lives. We also host the top 10 art colleges, and we bring them into our school um, to interview and do portfolio reviews with our students and our scholars to elevate their work further, right? Because if this is a language, then we should be bringing in the best people possible to hear you and to see you and to listen to you. Also, take kids on trips, have fun, right? Get out of the classroom. Um, this is a great example. My AP students, uh, when we first started the AP program uh, three years ago now, um, I sent a group text over winter break and said, hey, I'm going to go to a museum today. I don't know if you guys want to go, um, but if you do, I'm leaving at this time. And all but one of them showed up, right, just to hang out and have a good time and look at art. And I think the most important thing is something that I did at the on onset of this presentation, right? Share about yourself, be vulnerable, be more than vulnerable, right? be a human being, share that stuff that makes your heart beat fast, that makes your eyes tear up, that makes your face get red, right? You're asking your students to be vulnerable every single day and we owe it to them to do the same. Another one of the biggest first impressions you leave is your environment that you create. So you got to go above and beyond there, right? So we built a library last year, two years ago. Um, there's a coffee maker and tea for students every day for when they come in um, with mugs available so that um, kids can make themselves coffee or tea, right? Because as human beings, maybe they're stressed out or maybe they're tired and maybe they just need to have a cup of tea or coffee to, to keep going, right? That, by the way, going to Goodwill and spending $10 on mugs, coffee, and tea, and then maybe $15 a month to replenish that was one of the most meaningful things that affected culture and climate in my room from day one. And I think the last and most important way that you show that you care is to empower and uplift student voices through exposure and opportunities. Again, this is a language of expression. And if this is a language, then we have to value students deeply by putting their voices out there for the world. So 
we began hosting a fine arts showcase two years ago um, to, to show off student work in the arts. Uh, we had about 300 art pieces shown and we had 480 people attend our first ever arts gala. I have a video of that uh, to show you now. Gala, this art experience, right, showcase every uh, aspect of art that we have at our school. Because if we value students' voices, we should be putting everyone out there and showcasing the hard work that they do and the forms of communication and the things they have to say. So our band played, our dancers performed, we had film screenings, um, you know, our marching band was there, we had visual art up, uh, we had our, our poetry um, club um, doing, um, you know, like popping into crowds and doing poetry, performance art, things like that, right? Um, all of this is doable, doable and attainable, um, and all of it is important to sort of uplift students' voices and showcase them to the world. Another great example of this, we built a partnership with the Social Justice Sewing Academy, um, which has artists from Harvard and San Francisco partnering together. And so they came and taught uh, my students how to quilt, right? And we looked at the history of quilt making as a form of activism and resistance um, that arose during uh, slavery in this country. Um, and each of my students made a 15 by 15 inch quilt block uh, highlighting a social justice issue that they cared about. Um, this happened, has happened for the past three years, 180 students times three, I can't do the math, but imagine that, right? I mean, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of, of square feet of quilt blocks uh, floating around at galleries and museums around the country. Um, they were combined and they're being shown now in traveling exhibits across the country. So here's a few examples of those. Another really important thing as you know, teachers and adults in the room is acknowledging when we don't have the answer, right? Having the humility um, to leave our ego at the door and say, I can't solve this problem, but let me reach out to some people who might. So uh, my second year teaching at Poly, uh, we had a student um, who was shot and we lost an alumni to gun violence. I, had to acknowledge that I don't have the answer to that, right? I'm not a grief counselor. I don't know how to engage in those conversations in a way that will move students forward through their grief process. So I called someone who did. I called the Baltimore Seeds Fire Project, which is a grassroots uh, organization, anti-violence organization um, in Baltimore City. And they sent not one, but six grief counselors and anti-violence uh, specialists to work with our students. And not only that, they sent their president, uh, the head of their organization, Erica Bridgeford, and brought news cameras in to showcase the work that students were doing. This was very important, right? Because not only um, did it empower them to work through their feelings um, and work through their grief through art making, but it also allowed them to take control um, of a situation that felt so much outside of their control, right? Uh, these shirts that they created were put out into communities during a ceasefire weekend event. Um, and again, it, it gave students a sense of ownership of both their city and the situation. So transformative art experiences empower students and teachers. I'm gonna go further, schools, communities, and cities. I think that they give uh, language to core experiences that may escape our full comprehension without artistic interpretation. 
And I think that these questions and issues that these experiences raise empower students to be the agents of change and social reform that we so desperately need right now in our communities, in our schools, in our cities, in our country. And I think that if we employ transformative approaches to pedag and pedagogy into our classrooms and we begin to work with students, with communities, instead of for them or about them, then we as a country, as a city, as a community, we can all begin to rise together. So with that, I want to thank you guys so much. Um, I do, before I turn it over for questions, want to acknowledge that none of this, uh, none of these ideas are original, nor really uniquely mine, right? Um, there have been tons of educators who have been writing about these sorts of approach, approaches to education where we're decolonizing uh, and decentralizing the classrooms for a long time, right? Starting with Paulo Freire in the 1960s with the Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Lisa Delpit, Del Hooks, uh, Melissa Harris Perry. Um, there's tons of, of, of authors and writers and academics who are talking about this work. Um, Jonathan Gozal, Sonia Nieto, um, Ira Shore. Um, recently, Chris Emden, who read, wrote a great book for uh, white folks who teach in the hood and the rest of y'all too, right? Uh, Wanda B. Knight. There's, there's tons of great people doing this work. Um, so I would encourage you to, to check it out. I can make this resource slide available to you all um, and be happy to, to talk books and talk education. I love doing it. Um, this is my contact info. I'll leave the screen up for a few minutes um, and I'm happy to, to turn it over to you guys and just want to thank you for your time. Matt, thank you so much. Um, I have to tell you, I feel really moved and I appreciate how vulnerable and passionate you are and how much you shared in this presentation. And please also extend our thanks to your students for sharing the work in this presentation, which couldn't have been what it was without their work in it. Yeah, they're awesome. Um, I wanna just note, we have a lot of questions that have come up in the chat along the way. So I'll try to do my best to give voice to some of them and um, probably we'll have some time to hear from folks as well. One question, kind of a, a bucket that came up was a question around, do you have students who don't really want to share their personal experiences in assignments? And maybe that has to do with experiencing shame um, or other reasons that they don't want to actually bring this much of their private personal life to an assignment? Absolutely. The answer to that is for sure yes. And their answer to that is for sure like kids sometimes are just coming to the classroom and they're like, dude, it doesn't have to be this deep today. I just want to like relax and draw. And I think one of the, the most important tenets of this, right, is not to be projecting. And so if that happens, then I have to follow that, right? Because my job isn't to come in and project, but to work with students where they are, right? So there are some times where kids are like, bro, leave me alone right now with that, right? Miss me with all the deep stuff. And that's fine, right? That's totally okay. Um, what I do find more prevalently than not though, is that by sharing about my experiences from day one, about my dad going to jail, about growing up uh, pretty poor and being surrounded by violence, um, and sharing how I used art to, to work through that, I more often than not find students that are actually really looking for opportunities um, and safe places to talk about those things. And I think the important thing for us to realize is that regardless of whether or not we talk about it in a classroom, it is still happening for students, right? They are experiencing those things, no matter if we open it up to a classroom or not, or open it up to discussion in our classrooms or not. And I think the question for us as educators is, are we willing to plunge our hands in with them? Are we willing to sit with them in that discomfort, as messy as it may get, or not? That being said, there are plenty of students who are not ready for that yet, and our job is to honor them where they are. Thank you. Um, another kind of series of questions that came in are a little bit more nuts and bolts about the practicalities sure. of, you, of the work. So I'll, I'll pepper you with a couple and then see what we can get. What grade are the students in? How, are your, how is the committee actually selected that you work with to develop the curriculum? And um, how are students choosing this class as an elective or are they randomly placed? We'll start with those three. Okay, so um, I teach ninth through 12th grade, uh, mostly 11th and 12th. That being said, I have taught before this at a K through eight school and used this model from third grade and up. Um, so I think that it is applicable. You just have to scaffold it and scale it appropriately. Um, 
that's number one. Number two, how is the committee um, picked, right? For lack of a better word, assembled. Um, for the past two years, I've been very, very intentional about it in terms of trying to select students with very different experiences um, and then inviting them um, to come to the table. Recently, though, in thinking about it, I had a student actually email me, um, Jennifer, a few weeks ago and, and kind of confront me about it and made me really rethink things, especially now in this new kind of environment, how many students are not able to attend that after school, right? How many students have to work or go to a coach class or play a sport, right? In what ways was that practice of mine um, creating a challenge or a barrier for student voices? So I think I'm trying to re-envision that, um, maybe creating something digitally using the sort of lessons from, from COVID and everything that, that that has to teach us to sort of decentralize it even more and give more students opportunity and access to have their voices heard. So that's still a process of becoming, and so trying to figure out the way to, to give students the most access. Um, what was the, the third question? I'm sorry, Susan. Oh, not at all. Um, a question about is, is your class generally, are, are students selecting it as an elective or are they randomly placed? Got it. Um, both, both. Uh, the state of Maryland requires you have a full year of fine arts to graduate high school. So everyone has to take a fine arts course, whether that's dance, music, um, theater, film, etc. cetera. Um, I luckily um, always have a lot of requests from students for, for art, fine art, visual art to be the one that they, they use that, they, they fill that credit with. Um, and unfortunately we don't have enough seats to do it. So we accept 180 of maybe 300 um, who are listing that um, per year. But um, it is a requirement that they take an arts course. Um, yeah. Are any of these classes, do you, are they strictly arts classes or are you working in kind of an arts integration model with other subject area teachers? Um, the classes I teach are strictly arts focused, um, but I definitely try to push into other classes and try to share this model out um, because I think it is truly applicable anywhere. Um, and yeah, I try to integrate a lot of social studies and writing and things like that in as well because I think it's very relevant and easily translatable to the work that they're making. Let me ask one more question that came up in the chat and then we'll open it up for folks to, to chime in. Um, Particularly in relation to the way that you set up the space and how it's very inviting as an art space, a welcoming and empathetic space with the tea and with the opportunities to really connect and engage. What are your thoughts or your plans about moving forward in, in the era that we're in right now to extend that and to make sure that that empathy and presence is still happening? You know, I've thought a lot about it and I don't have many good answers truthfully, right? Um, here's where I'm at right now. I think that it would be incredibly beneficial um, for students to see me showing up in their neighborhoods with materials for them. Um, I can very easily send it through the post office um, and do it that way, but I think it is more beneficial for them to see me in their neighborhoods, knocking on their door, saying, like, yo, what's up? I'm excited to work with you. You know, I just wanted to bring these by for you, right? Um, so I think that that's that first thing of, of doing a little bit extra um, in this virtual space. Um, from there, I'm not certain yet. Um, and I'm still thinking about it. I think that this is um, a challenging year, right? Um, I would say I think on a fundamental foundational level, the most important thing right now is to be approaching education with an understanding um, that there's huge systems of inequity at play with distance learning and with going back to school in person, right? Um, and so in doing that, sort of thinking through how we are teaching in a way that is, is caring, inviting, empathetic, right? Not all students have access to computers or Wi-Fi or, or safe places within their home or food uh, or time, right? There's so much inequity that's going on with, with how distance learning has to play out um, for us to really think through um, I don't have any answers, but I think those are some really productive questions that I'm asking myself right now. Um, yeah. Well, hopefully all of us together over the next, you know, three weeks in this retreat will we'll generate some answers all together. So stick around, everybody. Um, yeah. I'm going to ask um, Susan Z to help me out here, if you would. If folks have other questions that I didn't 
um, see our cover or you just have new ones popping up, would you please use your raise hand in the participant um, pop out? And Susan Z, if you would track that and just um, give a shout out. Let's see, I think I can bring mine up too. So you can use your raise hand to let me know if you have any questions that are coming up and I'll call on you, we'll unmute you. And I can just remind you that um, if you're not finding where you can raise your hand, that if you point your cursor at your control panel or at the bottom of your screen to get your controls to pop out, you can double click to pop out the participant list. And at the bottom, there should be a blue hand that you can raise if you did want to ask some questions and unmute. If for whatever reason that's not working easily for you right now, feel free to chat them and I'll, I'll check them out in the chat box as well. Um, okay, I see A Tomlin's in four, so let's unmute and hear what you what your question is. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm curious how many mediums you were teaching and um, what was the final project? Because I see that they were doing drawings. I see that they were using probably colored pencils. Um, some people did watercolors. Um, I mean, you, what mediums and how did you work with that? And how, you know, how deep did you go in teaching them to use these different mediums to get it to express itself for them? That's a, a great question. Um, Typically during a year, we'll cover drawing, painting, watercolor, acrylic, gouache, uh, oil painting, uh, drawing with charcoal and pencil. We'll cover collaging um, and mixed media artwork. We'll cover found object um, and we'll cover clay sculpture as well as photography. Um, the uh, clay sculpture unit that, that isn't in here um, is a really fun one on, on questioning who gets a monument. Right, and what monuments mean and sort of like developing counter monuments um, to celebrate histories uh, that aren't celebrated or shown or, or monumentalized. So we, we definitely use a variety of material and medium. And I think the answer to your question of how we go about it, choosing it, um, I really just try to think about the large themes that students name and, and see where we can, we can plug in some of the core competencies or skills that I, I think are important. Um, in terms of final projects, uh, at the end of each year, students choose whatever material that they've used throughout the year, whether it's any of the ones that I just named, and then they create a series of three pieces that address an issue or a topic that's meaningful in their lives. So it is it's entirely student run, that last project, and they're just creating a series of three work. And it could be any size, um, any material. Do they have to vet what they're going to do or can they just, it's just an open thing? Um, great question. It is, there's a lot of scaffolding um, that happens. I wouldn't say vetted, right? Because I, I very rarely say no. Um, if really ever, actually, that I'm, now that I'm thinking about it. But there's a series of things like my main idea is blank. Piece one talks about blank. Piece two talks about blank. Piece three will talk about blank. I'm using this material because blank, right? All of these work together and this material is important because blank. And it all adds up to this thing, right? So there's a lot of writing and reflection that goes into it first to make sure they're approaching it intentionally. Um, that being said, I don't, I don't think that I've ever actually said no to anyone about their projects. I think they're usually approaching it pretty authentically. Okay. Sometimes they say, hey, like you might not be able to accomplish this in three, so maybe think about smaller pieces in six, right? Um, those conversations might happen, but very rarely um, am, I, am I vetting, so to speak. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to have one more question before we bring things to a close here for the day? Feel free to raise your hand or chat in the chat box. Nancy MacArthur, what's your question? Um, I'm just wondering if you find that you have 
uh, students with differing skill levels and how you foster an environment where skill level doesn't necessarily uh, determine how your ability to express yourself and how and like a non-competitive environment in that sense. That's such a good question, Nancy. Thank you. I think that uh, that is a lifelong effort, right? <laughs> Students, especially in high school, are, are very busy comparing themselves to others um, and wrestling with, as we all are, feelings of not being enough, especially in materials and mediums and classes where maybe they're not comfortable with. Um, I will share in uh, Baltimore City, um, we have just recently begun the initiatives and the work to make sure students have access to art um, K through 12. Um, in my years of teaching, there are many students who haven't had access to art, um, maybe ever, until they take my class in 11th grade or 10th grade. Um, I think the important thing there is to stress that this is a form of communication solely. Uh, one of the ways that I, I try to do that at the beginning of the year is I show this painting that I did of a letter that my dad sent me from jail, right? And it's a very realistic painting. It's got gold leaf around it. And I ask students, why is this a good painting? Is it a good painting? Why or why not? Most students say it's realistic. I can read it. That's a painting. It looks like I could take it off the thing, blah, 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 blah. And, and I, I sort of then say like, look, I don't actually care about any of that. This is a good painting to me because this is the first letter I got on my 16th birthday from my dad from jail, right? And that's why it's a good painting. It's deep, it's meaningful, it's vulnerable, right? That's what I care about. I care about you being real. Uh, and I, I say ex explicitly, I'm not interested in you being able to draw well, right? That's not my goal of being a teacher or, or you know, being an artist. My goal is that you, you feel like you are able to communicate with this thing. Right? This is more of a language class than it is anything else. Um, and I sort of try to stress that from day one and provide feedback accordingly, right? Where I'm not assessing based on technique um, until much later in the year. And even then, it's always a very gentle conversation. Well, thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you guys so very much. Matt, I'm going to ask you if you would to bring up your PowerPoint just so we have our, our closing slide here. And while you're doing that, um, Thank you. Susan Zoll, would you please bring up our poll? Um, we just have a quick poll to ask everybody to do an exit survey here, if you would, please. Um, and while you are doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and thank you for attending today's session, of course. Um, we'd love for you to go ahead and fill out that poll so we know how this workshop resonated with you. And I wanna let you know that a recording of our workshop and all of the others on our agenda will be available on NASA's YouTube channel, um, YouTube page within about a week. So keep checking our website and we'll be sending email communications about it as well. Um, we'll also be putting up here a link to the Facebook um, group to carry on our conversation at any time. And wanna address that we'll be sending via email in your inbox a weekly survey. So please keep your eye out and do help us by filling out the survey every week to let us know how, how the retreat is going for you. Um, so I think I wanna let you know that the 2020 Mid-Atlantic Teaching Artists Virtual Retreat is a co-sponsored project of the Mid-Atlantic State Arts Agencies in partnership with the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. We're really grateful for the generous support of all of these collaborators. Very grateful for your participation today, our attendees, Matthew, you as well. And I want to thank also Laura Young for interpreting and Susan Zoll for um, producing. I owe you guys a, a chat uh, with the Facebook. Um, there's the Facebook address. And with that, I just want to say thank you and goodbye. And we'll see you hopefully at later, later workshops. Thanks very much. Thank you all so much for all of your work facilitating this. Absolutely welcome.